The alchemist Gerhard Dorn was a very important figure for Jung. Dorn was one of the few alchemists at the end of the 16th century who realized that alchemical symbolism and tradition implied a religious problem. This is one of the reasons Jung found him so significant. In contrast to many others, he tried to engage the problem of the conflict between the alchemical approach and the religious approach. Jung quotes an alchemical text. The center of this magnet contains a hidden salt, a menstruum of calcinating the philosophical goal. This prepared salt forms their mercury, with which they perform the magistry of the sages in white and in red. It becomes an ore of heavenly fire, which acts as a ferment for their stone. In Dorn's view, therefore, the secret of the magnet's effect lies in a salt. It is both hidden in the magnet on the one hand, that is already present in nature and is also prepared by the adept, that is a product of his art. Jung continues, a similar state of affairs can be found in Dorn's writings. In his case, it is not a question of sol sapientia, the salt of wisdom, but the veritas which for him is hidden in natural things and at the same time is obviously a moral concept. This truth is the medicine, improving and transforming that which is no longer into that which it was before its corruption, and that which is not into that which it ought to be. It is a metaphysical substance, hidden not only in things but in the human body. A certain metaphysical substance known to very few, which need no medicament, being itself an incorrupt medicament. Therefore, it is the study of the chemist to liberate that unsensual truth from its fetters in things of sense. In that same theme, Dorn is quoted as saying, There is a certain truth that is veritas in natural things which is not seen with the outward eye but is perceived by the mind alone, and of this the philosophers have had experience and have ascertained that its virtue is such that it performs miracle. This means that this stuff, this magical hidden stuff that is veritas, is equated with the ichneus or remorophis on the one hand and with the magnet which attracts and catches the remorophis on the other hand. Jung further remarks on the subject of Veritas. Nevertheless, Dorn succeeded in explaining the magnetic attraction between the imagined symbol, the theoria, and the center hidden in matter, or in the interior of the art or in the North Pole, as the identity of two extremes. That is why the theoria and the arcanum in matter are both called truth. This truth shines in us, but it is not of us. It is to be sought not in us, but in the image of God which is in us. In other words, the only thing that truly exists for him is the transcendental self, which is identical with God. This pronouncement that Veritas alone has being and is the truth means in psychological terminology that the self is the root and source of all our experiences. Now let us consider this archetypal image, that is Veritas, which gripped Gerhard Dorn so powerfully. We translate the word into English as truth, but the concept has a long historical background and has had a very powerful symbolic impact. In ancient Egypt, it was represented by the goddess Mat. It was she who presided at the weighing of the souls in the afterlife. Our feeder was put on one balance pan and the heart of the deceased was put in the other, and if they did not balance, the heart was thrown to the monster which was waiting to devour it. The soul of the deceased was measured on the basis of truth as the ultimate criterion. In ancient Greece, the term for truth was aletheia, which is a negative term. The a is a prefix which signifies absence of and what is absent is lithi, the water of forgetfulness, which is what one drinks when one comes into conscious existence. When the soul is born, it drinks lethe, so that it forgets its prenatal life. For the ancient Greek, truth was alithi, meaning the absence of forgetfulness or the presence of memory. 
Plato uses this term alete to distinguish the eternal world of forms from the phenomenal world of appearance. Alete refers to the world of forms. In Hebrew, the word comparable to aletheia is inet. In the New Testament, Christ uses this term to refer to something of supreme importance. For instance, in John 8.32, he says, You will learn the truth, that is, aletheia in Greek and veritas in Latin, and the truth will make you free. In John 16.13, Christ tells his disciples that he must die, but after his death, he will send the Paraclete, the Comforter. He says that when the Comforter comes, the Spirit of Truth will lead you to the complete truth. So the coming Paraclete is described as the Spirit of Truth. The Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit is a synonym for the Paraclete. So the Spirit of Truth and the Holy Ghost are symbolic equivalents. When Christ was being examined before Pontius Pilate, the governor who presided over the trial of Jesus and ultimately ordered his crucifixion, Christ said, I came into the world for this, to bear witness to the truth, and all who are on the side of truth listen to my voice. Then Pilate replied cynically, Quid es veritas, what is truth? If we apply this symbolism to the analytical process, we can say that veritas corresponds to the latent consciousness hidden in the unconscious of the patient. It is the consciousness that accompanies the imagery of the self, of wholeness, that can set us free, and it can be drawn forth as a magnet attracts iron with the help of the analyst's interpretations and responses, and the consciousness the analyst brings to bear on the psychology of the patient. Another way of putting it would be to say that the analyst's personal relation to the self functions like a magnet which constellates and draws forth or activates the self in the patient, bringing it into manifestation. Thus Veritas, which has the ability to perform miracles, is made manifest.